Okay. Uh, Everyone, okay, this slide was fine. So uh, first, welcome to USC and uh, Los Angeles. Um, so as you probably know, yesterday it was announced that Los Angeles will hopefully host uh, the Summer Olympic game either in 2024 or 2028. So uh, it's a very big deal for Los Angeles and also a big deal for USC. Probably as you, many of you know, the uh, um, Opponent, I think somewhere is very close and very bad at directions, but it's very close, just one block away from us. So that means that we're going to have a lot of events and that also means that we're going to do a lot of research around sustainability. Hopefully that we can collaborate uh, further through this different type of synergistic activities and then uh, push forward to make Los Angeles a better city. Anyway, so uh, with that, first I want to introduce a little bit of myself. I'm a social professor in uh, USC in the computer science department. I also have a joint appointment uh, in EE department. My major research work is on time series and spatial temporal data analysis with applications uh, to different areas, and one of them is actually sustainability-related application. So uh, when we talk about uh, my research area, many people will ask, well, why are you interested in time series or spatial temporal data analysis? Uh, I'll start to motivate us to say uh, a quote from uh, a famous uh, scientist, Albert Einstein. He has been quantified that a human being is part of a whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. Basically, time and space are naturally appearing in our universe, and this is where we live in. So before, what had happened in machine learning community is that we collect data from different areas, and because of the limitation of the technology, a lot of the data are assumed their ID. However, with the development of the sensor technology, satellite technology, all different type of technology, now we are able to get large amount of time series and spatial temporal data. Uh, either around where we live in, that will be our environment, uh, that uh, will be essentially something around uh, the facility and infrastructure we build, the power system or traffic, uh, or even about our human being ourselves, either around health or about our brain, how the brain functions. So uh, as you can see, this large amount of data basically opens up the opportunity for us to do more research work around machine learning, how we will be able to analyze these data will be able to enable scientific discovery. Uh, so usually that when we talk about time series data, we usually, uh, the first thing come out in our mind is actually forecasting. So uh, I would say that actually for time series machine learning or data mining questions, there are a lot of them. Here I listed a few fundamental problems and some of the application tasks. So I would say that for fundamental problems, there's three of them. One is about the dependence discovery, that is given large amount of time series data, how they are actually correlated with each other. And the second thing is representation learning, that is whenever we given time series data, how we will be able to extract features from them. And the second, third one is about metric learning, that is given the time series, then how we define similarity between them. Obviously that for images or for many other structured data, it is relatively easier to define similarity, but for time series it's really difficult. So given the pro uh, solution of this fundamental problem, there's obviously a lot of application paths that we see all the time. One of them is forecasting, and the other is classification, retrieval, clustering anomaly detection. Uh, this application goes on and on. So when we look at what has happened before, uh, we'll say that there's a large amount of work uh, in statistical community, economics, and finance. Uh, there's some uh, research work in machine learning, uh, but there's limited uh, efforts in there. So uh, our research work is trying to leverage a recent development in all these areas around time series and trying to develop scalable and efficient solutions. So, um, so the major challenge that we're facing in mining scalable uh, mining time series data uh, I would say that this mostly involving three aspects. One is the dimensionality, that means that we're going to get uh, many number of time series. This may mean that we're going to get thousands of locations of the weather conditions uh, across the world, or this may mean that we're going to get millions of users on social media website. 
Uh, scalability, of course, is another issue comes together with the time series observations. And also, uh, the dependencies among these time series data are more complex. Another way I would like to quantify this is also using uh, a lot of the analogy that has been used uh, in computer vision uh, technology community. So basically, when we look at uh, the retrieval of the languages, or a lot of the things that we work on are pattern matching. So we'll say this is the first level uh, of uh, analysis challenges. That means that human being can do this, but they have to do this repetitively. It is relatively easy task, uh, but they can do it. It's repetitive, and machine is going to replace this repetitive efforts. On the second level is our human being. We can understand the languages. We can see the images. We can see the video. We can understand them. And then we're trying to use human being to teach the machine how to actually understand the images and the languages. This is the second level. On the third level, that is actually what we are working on. That's basically we human beings are not very good at actually looking at large-scale time series data or spatial temporal data. And then we're also trying to leverage the machine power to try to co-collaborate together to understand what's going on. So I would say that is also a much more challenging and difficult task. There is a lot of unknown spaces. So in the past, I would say seven years after joining USC, uh, our major contribution is trying to develop scalable and effective solutions for analyzing time series and spatial temporal data by leveraging progresses across different disciplines. Uh, for example, we have work on the Granger graphical model, basically leveraging uh, advances in economics on Granger causality and uh, with the shrinkage uh, uh, selection using regularization uh, from the statistics community. Uh, or we have been working on this point process model, mostly borrowing concepts from statistical community and also economics community. So uh, by, by developing this machine learning model, we were also able to enable a large number of applications. Here I'm going to give uh, two applications as an ability domain. Uh, one is that uh, using this Granger uh, graphical model that we developed, we're able to uncover the temporal dependencies uh, from the time series data. That means we will be able to tell, okay, uh, what is the current value of, car of one time series will actually be determining the future values of other time series. And the application that we use is actually by analyzing the large-scale uh, uh, climate applications, the data of collected climate science, we were able to identify in what will be the major causes for uh, the climate change, uh, that is the extreme high value of temperature uh, using the data-driven approaches. So this paper was uh, started when I was working in IBM research, and then later after uh, I joined IBM, I got funded by the NSF Korea Award, where we continue uh, the study on this particular application. Another one uh, is supported by the NSF CyberSeas program, basically that we try to develop deep learning solutions uh, to identify uh, the causes for urban heat island. Uh, as many of you that Los Angeles is a big metropolitan and urban heat island phenomenon is a major effect to us. And many of the factors contributing to this particular urban heat island effect. And then we work with the uh, uh, experts in civil engineering and environmental engineering and also collaborate with Office of Sustainability of Los Angeles City. Uh, we were able to actually collect the data around Los Angeles area identifying uh, the causes for for uh, the uh, urban heat island. And we're also working with the uh, mayor's office trying to develop policies uh, so that we can resolve this issue of urban heat island and also air pollution. So uh, this hopefully gives you a quick overview of what we have been doing from machine learning aspect and also the application uh, in sustainability. So next I'm going to move forward with the main topic of this particular tutorial on how we can use tensor technologies for analyzing spatial temporal data. So uh, as many of uh, us know that uh, spatial temporal data is basically uh, prominent in sustainability applications. And it is very much in great demanding where we will be able to actually identify uh, different accurate and fast modeling and analysis tools for analyzing these data. 
Uh, there are many interesting tasks that are associated with the spatial temporal data. For example, we can do forecasting that is trying to predict the future values, let's say the weather, uh, uh, the temperature in a particular location, or we can do some type of creaking can do, basically for uh, we are going to collect the uh, weather condition across different locations, but for a location we don't have a weather station, how we will be able to predict the value for a uh, newly unobserved location. Uh, sometimes we can also in social media application we can do recommendation uh, where we can predict the variables for missing product ratings uh, or uh, many other um, uh, around applications. For example, we can do clustering, uh, anomaly detection, optimal design. So uh, that basically demands us to develop these scalable and also accurate uh, machine learning tools for analyzing spatial temporal data. So uh, when we try to design these different type of tools, we look at two things. One is that uh, what is the data structure look like and also what are the existing work. So first I'll motivate this from the data structure perspective. So when we look at the multivariate spatial temporal data, uh, we usually say, okay, we can think of the observations or the input will be multiple features measured on a set of locations over different time. So uh, this is basically we're looking at different dimensions and then we see the observations across different dimensions. And uh, there's sometimes maybe additional information, that means that we're going to have uh, some additional input in terms of, okay, the location adjacency. Uh, let's say in terms of the weather application, we're going to get uh, the location adjacency of different weather uh, locations. Uh, or we can do uh, some other network and there will be indicating how one person is similar to the other or how one weather, can, uh, si uh, weather station is similar to the others. That means that we're going to be given additional input uh, in addition to uh, the multivariate time series data. And uh, a lot of tasks as I mentioned, forecasting, co creaking or recommendation. So uh, next I'm going to also motivate this from the existing work perspective. Uh, the challenges has been quite apparent. Basically that we have to model these high order correlations. Uh, that's one major challenge in machine learning. The other one is that there's a lot of nonlinear dynamics. That means that the data sometimes may not be linearly dependent uh, and also they may actually change the behavior over the time and high dimensionality as well, but because when we look at different dimension, uh, we're going to have thousands of weather locations, we're going to be interested in monitoring maybe hundreds of weather uh, parameters uh, and also across many different, uh, uh, across a very long time. So uh, existing work, basically people have developed a different uh, methodology. Uh, some of them are actually quite correlated with each other. So for example, in Bayesian statistics, a large community has been focusing uh, on developing these Bayesian hierarchical spatial temporal models. Uh, there are many, many versions of these Bayesian hierarchical model developed. The major challenges for this type of problem is that uh, it is very difficult to do the inference. Usually MCMC sampling have to be applied, but usually this takes a lot of time for uh, the inference algorithm to converge. Another one is mostly by machine learning community. There is a many uh, recent development in Gaussian process. So uh, the major challenges in there is obviously trying to estimate the covariance matrix. And uh, if we talk about really high dimension, it's going to result in a huge uh, covariance matrix that we're going to analyze and trying to do inference on. So uh, a lot of development have been going on uh, in machine learning trying to develop this Bayesian optimization, try to speed up the inference processes. A lot of progress has been made, but there's still uh, the scalability is still on the hot topic in terms of the development. And also recently people have looked at uh, trying to do the reduced rank or fixed rank rigging or uh, trying to reduce the dimensionality uh, through uh, the um, uh, modeling the latent structures. Uh, there's development on that, but at the same time that the model is still relatively complex. So um, the main issue as I motivated you just now, basically that either we have to make strong assumptions of how the model will look like to make the model simplified, or let's say that we have to actually uh, model these strong correlations, making the model really complex and it's not efficient. Uh, 
So uh, that's basically set up the stage for us to look at some rather simple pro uh, approaches to uh, solve the problem. So uh, our motivation is basically as follows. That is there any way we can develop something relatively simple using data-driven approaches? And then we'll be able to make the algorithm scalable instead of speeding up complex machine learning model. So uh, the technique that we resort to uh, is basically trying to capture some major principles in all these machine learning models when they try to analyze or model spatial temporal data. Uh, one is usually known as the local smoothness. That means that uh, for features or the values that say temperature uh, that we're trying to observe, if they're, uh, the locations are in similar neighborhood, then usually that we want them to share similar values. This has been used in many, many of the machine learning model or statistical models. Uh, basically, we want to impose a smoothness over uh, adjacent location observations. And the other one that many, uh, uh, many machine learning models adopt is actually uh, the global latent structure. This is trying to model the situation uh, where the data may actually lie on a lower dimensional latent structure, uh, but intuitively we can explain it as follows. So let's say that we have the observations across uh, the globe in terms of the weather conditions. And there are also locations where even though they are not adjacent to each other, let's say Los Angeles versus uh, 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 a Mediterranean area in Europe, they are very far away from each other, but actually their uh, weather behavior are very similar because they all belong to this uh, Mediterranean weather uh, or climate system. So uh, that means that there's some natural grouping uh, of the spatial temporal data we want to capture so that we can share similar properties, making the model simpler. So uh, these are the basic two principles that we uh, try to incorporate in the model uh, will capture the major characteristics in spatial temporal data. Uh, that is local smoothness and also the global latent structures. And uh, the way that we try to address the problem, as the title suggests, is actually the tensor. So uh, why we're interested in tensor? First, I guess before motivating this, we want to give uh, basically the definition for some of you who may not be familiar with the concept. Um, so uh, this was first introduced in physics and mathematics, basically uh, that you can either think of this as a transformation of coordinates or generalization of vectors and matrices. Uh, usually that in computer science, when we talk about the data structure, you can think of them as basically as a multi-dimensional array uh, and also there's some in, a very effective analysis to associate with it. So uh, here we'll list a brief history of the tensor. Uh, this obviously started uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. Uh, mathematicians and later physicists introduced the concept. And then there's a large amount of development, especially in numerical analysis uh, and also in early computer science theory aspect. We have developed different type of tensor decomposition techniques so that we can analyze the data. And more recently, we started to look at the efficient perspective. Uh, let's say we look at the low rank tensor completion, or we try to do more robust tensor analysis. Uh, so as we can see that uh, with the large amount of data accumulated uh, by our different type of technologies, now there's a large interest in analyzing uh, tensor data and also developing scalable tools uh, for tensor analysis. So uh, our work essentially emerges as uh, the intersection of all this excitement and development. So uh, when we look at uh, the spatial temporal data, what is the tensor representation? We think that spatial temporal data can naturally be expressed as tensors. For example, that we can think of them as three-dimensional tensor. Uh, one dimension is across different location. Uh, the other uh, dimension is across time. And the third dimension is, let's say, the different features that we're collecting. Uh, this is naturally and intuitively represented. I don't think I need to uh, uh, reiterate too much. But on the other side, that we also need to look at what is the tensor formulation, uh, trying to address and model uh, the principles that has been adopted by most machine learning or statistical models. Uh, one is the local smoothness, and the other is the global latent structure that I motivated two slides ago. So uh, similar as the matrix representation, when we try to impose the local smoothness, one way we can achieve this is actually uh, by simple 
adding uh, the Laplace in regularization uh, constructed from the adjacency matrix. Uh, I can, I'm going to explain this more in detail. In here, I just gave you a very high level overview. Uh, the other one is this global latent structure. That means that we're trying to look at some latent uh, structure uh, representations within the data. And similar to matrix, this can also be achieved uh, by actually using some of the low rank constraint. That means that we want uh, the data to actually approximate low rank. That means that the data are generated by uh, a set of relatively lower dimensional spaces so that we will be able to capture their commonness uh, in the data. So uh, these are the two ways that we're going to capture uh, the major principle adopted by the machine learning models. Next, I'm going to give you two specific examples so that you can see how we can formulate the spatial temporal data uh, analysis task into the tensor analysis uh, formulation. The first one uh, is the problem called uh, co-creaking. First, I'm going to explain what is co-creaking, and then I'm going to uh, use the math representation. And then later, I will show you that given the specific formulation, uh, basically that we can represent a problem as the low rank tensor regression problem. So uh, first, uh, I'm going to explain what is co-creaking. Uh, so uh, first, uh, explaining creaking, basically, as I mentioned, is that we're trying to predict the value for location we do not have any observations. And then co-creaking means that we're going to predict uh, the multiple values uh, for this unknown location. A very nice example is uh, in the weather prediction. Uh, let's say that we collect the data from uh, Santa Monica, uh, from Los Angeles downtown, from, uh, let's say, uh, 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 Los Angeles airport, LAX, right? Uh, but we do not have the data, let's say, uh, in USC specifically. And then we're trying to predict, okay, what is the temperature uh, of USC? What is the rain precipitation? Uh, what is uh, the solar radiation and stuff like that? That means that we're going to jointly predicting unknown variables for, uh, uh, for this particular location. We do not have any observations. So uh, this is the setting for co-creaking. So next we're going to uh, mathematically formulate this. Uh, first, let's take a look uh, at the formulation. We assume that there will be some complete data uh, that can be represented as a tensor. Uh, first, remember, we do not ob fully observe the, the, the data, uh, but assuming that there is ground truth of it. Uh, so we can represent them as a three-way tensor uh, that will be P by T by M. P will be the number of locations. T will be the number of timestamps that we are collecting the observations, and M will be uh, the number of features uh, that we uh, are interested in observing. And then uh, next, uh, since the data are actually partial observed, uh, so that means that we're going to uh, actually have a subset of the location observed uh, among this complete data. Here we're going to have an omega, which will represent a subset uh, of the locations from 1 to p. And then uh, the objective is that we're going to estimate uh, another tensor W, uh, which will actually approximate the ground truth as much as possible. And specifically, uh, we want to make sure for no locations uh, that w uh, the W for these unknown locations, the estimation will be uh, approximately similar uh, as the, uh, the complete data. So uh, this is where we get started. And next, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, the objective function and also uh, basically the optimization function. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the formulation uh, will be relatively simple. The first one is that uh, we want our estimator W, uh, that is the estimation tensor, will be approximately similar to the ground truth data and uh, for the known locations. And that is why we're going to impose this particular loss term, uh, which is represented uh, in here. Uh, basically, this will represent a continuous norm uh, of uh, the tensor indexes by the known location omega, uh, the sequence uh, and, and finally uh, tensor omega that will be uh, the uh, ground truth in terms of the known locations. So this way we can approximate uh, the uh, observations as much as possible. 
And the second thing is that we want to impose a, a local smoothness. That means that we want the observations in similar neighborhood will have similar observations. And this is achieved by the following. So here we are going to introduce L, that is the Laplacian matrix, uh, where which is constructed by uh, from the location adjacency matrix that we were given. Uh, once we have the Laplacian matrix, and then we're going to impose this Laplacian regularizer. That means across different uh, features that we're interested, and then when we are going to impose that similar location, these features will have similar values. And that's where we're going to impose the local uh, consistency. And the last one uh, is also very easy to understand. Uh, we also want the data to speak for themselves. That means that for our estimator W, that is the final prediction, uh, we want the data to be approximately low rank. And that is where we actually where we impose the rank uh, of W that uh, our estimation uh, estimator uh, uh, tensor uh, will be smaller uh, equal to rho. So here rho is obviously a parameter we need to set the tune by. Uh, so, uh, given this particular formulation, uh, at the last day we are going to basically estimating W uh, so that we can make predictions on. As you can see, uh, this is a very simple formulation uh, where we only need to let the data to speak for themselves. There are no uh, assumptions in terms of how the data will be ge are generated. Uh, there is relatively uh, low, uh, re low number of constraints that we impose in terms of estimating the tensor itself. So uh, that's essentially one uh, example where we can set uh, this particular co-creating application prediction task to a tensor formulation. So the next one, I'm going to use the forecasting as an example. So uh, forecasting, as I mentioned, refers to the estimation of future values of the multivariate time series given the historical values. Next, I'm also going to do the same thing. I'm going to introduce what is observation, what is the target uh, output, and then I'm going to use the tensor formulation to address the problem. So uh, usually for time series data, we uh, use different type of uh, ARIMA model or uh, uh, VAR model. So in this formulation, we're going to use the simple uh, VAR model. Uh, that is the vector autoregressive model. Uh, so first, uh, let's take a look at how we're going to make predictions using the vector regressive model. Assuming uh, that we are going to have uh, the observations that will be x, Okay, uh, it is still represented as a tensor. And then we are interested in making predictions for the next uh, val uh, the value in the next time step. Uh, that is uh, xt uh, plus 1. And then uh, the way that uh, the uh, vector autoregressive model works is as follows. First, we are going to construct uh, the so-called uh, lagged observation, that is how long a history uh, that we are going to consider use, uh, which will be used to making the predictions for the next time step. So uh, first, I'm going to introduce this uh, uh, XTM. Uh, that is basically uh, the input observations, that is the historical data. Uh, here we use k, that means we're going to look at k time step uh, before uh, the prediction. And then the second one is that we're going to be using the simple vector of regressive processes. That means that we're assuming the data will be uh, modeled by a linear model. So that is why we have w, that is the coefficient uh, tensor. Uh, basically, that, that means that uh, we're going to predict uh, uh, the future values using a linear combination of the historical values. And that is why there we have uh, w uh, indexed by m and then uh, multiply by XTM and plus some um, epsilon, that is basically uh, the noise term. And then our final prediction can actually be modeled simply by this linear combination uh, of uh, coefficients with the historical values. So uh, this is basically the, uh, the vector autoregressive model. Next, we're going to do the following. That is, uh, let's say that we are interested in estimating the coefficient tensor W. We're also going to impose the following constraint uh, or the optimization function. The first one is that we want our estimator, uh, that is uh, x bar, uh, x hat, will be uh, close to our observations as much as possible. This will be similar as before. We use the convenience norm to impose this 
uh, constraints so that we can get these two values as similar as possible. And the second part, as I mentioned, will be the local consistency, that is the local smoothness. And this is where uh, now we're going to look at the predicting values. We want them to be as smooth as possible. Similar as before, we have L, that is the Laplacian mat uh, matrix, constructed by the, from the location adjacency matrix. And here we also want to impose uh, the predicting values, that is the uh, x hat will be as similar uh, in terms of locations. Uh, the, the value of the uh, adjacent locations will be similar as possible. And the last one is that we're also going to uh, make the subject to the constraint that our uh, estimation coefficient tensor w uh, to have uh, some local, a global consistency. Here, again, we use the graph of the W will be smaller or equal to no, uh, which will uh, impose this particular constraint. So uh, as you can see, uh, here we have very similar formulation as the previous one, where we represent this particular forecasting problem for spatial temporal data with three terms. One is the loss term, uh, that which uh, means that we're going to approximate the observation as much as possible. And then we have the local uh, consistent term uh, constrained by the uh, Laplacian uh, regularization and also the global consistency achieved by the low rank constraint. So uh, this is, uh, these two examples illustrate uh, what we can do in terms of tensor formulation. And uh, so in this particular paper that we published in NIP 2014, uh, 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 where uh, basically we do a little bit more uh, derivation. So uh, we have illustrated in this particular paper where uh, for both co craiging tasks and also for the forecasting tasks that are illustrated, even though the formulation is not exactly the same, in the end all of them can be actually reduced uh, to this uh, low rank tensor regression problem. Uh, so basically, by solving this low rank uh, tensor regression problem, we'll be able to solve both the co creaking task and also doing this forecasting task. Uh, you may be interested in knowing, okay, what is the y and z in this particular uh, tensor regression? Uh, so in the, uh, in the paper, uh, we have illustrated that is given the input observations, either in the co creaking task or the forecasting task, then we will be able to construct uh, this y and z uh, very straightforwardly. So uh, that is basically that um, ends up to our research problem because it seems to us that a lot of these spatial temporal data analysis tasks can be formulated into this low rank tensor regression problem and therefore our core research area is how we will be able to actually develop fast uh, algorithm to solve this optimization problem. Yes, I see. Yeah, it comes mostly from the Laplacian smoothing, but obviously that we want uh, this uh, capture some of the local, uh, the global uh, consistency. So in many of the cases we are facing, uh, maybe that the whole of the, for the location that is totally missing, then uh, mostly we are relying similar as the uh, uh, very one where we only look at the local uh, areas. Uh, but for some of the cases where we may be able to get uh, some very sparse observations, and in there, this we can significantly leverage this global low rank consistency so that we'll be able to find uh, the locations where, even though they're far away from each other, uh, but hopefully, that by capturing some of the sparse, uh, sparse observations, we can uh, leverage more data from uh, uh, observations far away. Yeah, so for example, if there were two places that had the same weather that they were far apart, but then you can use that. Yeah, because yeah. they so lie very close in the manifold. Yeah, so exactly. So if we don't have too much data, let's say there's zero observations, then we have to mostly rely on the uh, Laplacian regularization. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 uh, is, is the radical straight convex and if not, how do you optimize uh, It's not convex. So that's why that we have developed the corresponding um, optimization tools uh, to speed things up. Uh, Question? How do you recommend the uh, road? 
Uh, oh, how do we actually determine the role? That is a very good question. Uh, we have to do this uh, simply by cross validation. We don't have magic on there. Sometimes there's some domain knowledge come by and say we're interested uh, in predicting, uh, modeling the climate system, and then uh, by working and talking to the climate scientists, you may say, oh, there may be, uh, let's say, six or seven different type of climate system on the Earth, and you probably want to try that as a starting point, and then we tune this. Okay, so uh, next I'm going to uh, give you uh, First, to stress a little bit of the advantages of the model. One is that it is fully non-parametric. Uh, we let the data to speak for themselves. Uh, we do not need to impose many of the uh, correlation constraint that has been employed by existing machine learning model. Uh, and the other thing is that we can actually incorporate many of the existing techniques. As I will show you later, uh, you are going to see a lot of algorithm that you are familiar with that we're going to use to speed things up. So uh, there are uh, two things I want to mention briefly. Uh, one is that uh, is about the rank of the tensor. Uh, there are many, many different ways, uh, I shouldn't say many, but there are several different ways to define uh, the tensor, uh, the rank of a tensor. Unlike the matrices, it is very easy to define the rank for tensor. Uh, there are many ways, and sometimes one way is better than the other. Uh, so uh, in this particular case that we typically use the mode and rank, uh, so uh, basically the definition is very simple. That is, uh, we are going to unfold the tensor along different locations, along different dimensions, and then we're going to have a sum of the rank of the unfolded tensor along different dimensions. Uh, the, quite, the reason why we want to use this is because it is relatively easy for us to calculate, and also it is unique. So that is why we just go with this particular definition. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, just show some experiment results to give you a quick idea in terms of how well it performs. Uh, so we uh, do this on two different applications. One of them, as I mentioned, is the, sustainable, is the climate application, uh, where we get uh, time series and spatial uh, 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 time series observations uh, of the climate uh, applications uh, in different data sets. Uh, the other one is we also try this out uh, for the social media uh, uh, activity check-in data. Uh, we want to look at different aspects because for uh, the climate application, the data for the spatial temporal data you are going to see in different location, uh, on different location, and a streaming of time series observations. And then uh, for social media application, as many of you know, is that uh, the activity is actually sparse. That means that some user check in some locations at some time, and then uh, they never check in after a very long time. So you are going to see very different type of tensors. One is very sparse tensor uh, that is in, spa uh, in the social media application. The other is that for uh, climate application, the, the tensor will be very dense. So uh, hopefully this gives uh, a big picture of what the data will look like. And first I'm going to show the example uh, in a climate application. Uh, we uh, first compare uh, on the co-creaking task, uh, we're comparing our tensor formulation uh, with some matrix formulation and also with the multitask Gaussian process model. So as you can see that our model were able to achieve uh, better prediction performance. Here the number is uh, RMSE, that is the root mean uh, square error, and then uh, the lower the, uh, the better, so basically our uh, results uh, are showing that the tensor formulation uh, give us a lot of advantages. And then in terms of the forecasting, uh, we also compare with a series of uh, uh, baselines. Uh, similar as before, we have our tensor formulation. Uh, we also have, let's say, ADMM orthogonal NL or trees. Uh, this is basically trying to use the matrix formulation. And also we have multitask L1 or multitask uh, dirty that is basically using the Gaussian process. So for this particular application, we think that uh, we are able to achieve similar prediction performance uh, uh, as the baseline. Not necessarily significant improvement, uh, but at least we're able to actually get a comparable performance. And then when we look at actually the speed up, uh, as I will show you later, that uh, our algorithm is much faster. 
uh, one, another reason why we want to look at a tensor formulation instead of alternative is that we will be able to actually look at why we are able to make the predictions. So that means that we can interpret the model. Uh, in the paper that we draw in here, uh, we try to draw on the US uh, locations uh, the map of the most predictive reasons, uh, uh, re uh, regions. So here, uh, what and that is shown uh, as the blue bar in there. So uh, when we look at the map, it seems to agree with a lot of the uh, uh, no existing knowledge on uh, the climate system. Uh, let's see, Los Angeles, basically, we don't look at the weather uh, prediction at all. We know it's going to be set late every day. The temperature will be nice. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, in around like Bucena or uh, uh, Miami, Right, or the Florida region in general, that it is also more predictive. Uh, on the other side, when we look at uh, these great place areas, uh, there are a lot of changes, uh, there's a lot of wind happening, and that is why it is relatively hard to make predictions on. So uh, we just want to give an interpretation of the models so that we can say, in c comparison to this deep learning model or the Gaussian process model, uh, the simpler methods were able to give us some interpretation of why we're making these predictions. So uh, next, I'm also going to show quickly about the spatial temporal task, uh, prediction task for uh, social media application. And similar as before, that our method is able to achieve uh, comparable prediction performance as a more complex prediction model. So uh, last, I'm going to show you the uh, running time so that you can see uh, how well our method can perform in terms of efficiency. So here we compare a few factors, which uh, one is based on this tensor formulation, uh, and then this ADM map is basically trying to uh, compare with the matrix formulation, but with the uh, optimization technique using ADM map. And then we also have the multivariate regression process model. So for uh, the uh, forecasting task, uh, we're able to achieve uh, all the prediction performance within 100 seconds for the data that we collected. And then when we look at alternatives in matrix formulation with uh, not fast uh, optimization technique, that uh, it is uh, comparable sometimes in this number. Uh, but for multi uh, for the multi-task motion process model, uh, this literally takes several days to complete the task. So uh, similar for co-creating, and uh, we have to stop uh, the multi-task motion process because it literally takes more than weeks. So we just uh, stop uh, there. Uh, what we're trying to say using this comparison is that sometimes we do not necessarily need to resort to complex model to achieve similar prediction performance. Using the tensor formulation, it is simple. We're able to get similar prediction performance, but we're able to get uh, the results much faster. So uh, that is why that we want to say uh, it is a nice, simple, and also interpretable uh, solution for analyzing the spatial temporal data. In this particular picture, we also want to show you uh, in terms of uh, what uh, we have been doing, what we have done uh, within the whole uh, tensor framework. So, uh, as I motivated earlier, uh, the whole formulation can be reduced into the slow ramp tensor regression problem. And our task can literally be formulated as two. One is that how we can develop scalable algorithm to solve the slow ramp tensor regression problem, which um, we dis just discussed, it is not complex, it is difficult to optimize over. Uh, so we have developed three different techniques to address different issues. One is that we develop this uh, greedy based algorithm uh, to uh, solve the optimization problem with, uh, get a uh, with um, performance guarantees for the batch learning scenario. That means that we were given all this data, then we're going to do batch update, and then we can use this greedy based algorithm. And then the second one that we have worked on, which was published in uh, ICM 2015, is that uh, we look at an online version. So let's say uh, a lot of the spatial temporal data comes at the screen, then how we will be able to actually update our model on the fly. And therefore, we develop this model called Alto, which will be able to do this online update fast. The basic idea is relatively simple, where we're going to use this low ramp tensor core and also use the randomization to get over the local optimal 
to actually speed up the process a lot. And then uh, this paper was published uh, uh, in 2016, uh, last year, where we're, we have developed this memory efficient solutions. So uh, in many of the applications where uh, we do have access to the supercomputer, we do this online update. And in other applications, for example, in uh, these mobile phones, if we want to load the data even inside the mobile uh, devices, uh, it would be very difficult. Uh, and therefore, we are confronted with this memory, uh, uh, limited memory constraint. Uh, in this particular paper, uh, we developed this uh, algorithm based on sketching. We will be able to sample the data to represent the, uh, the whole data collection effectively, and also uh, we can get similar prediction performance. So uh, this is in terms of the scalability aspect, because uh, to, in order to um, uh, have the time response and also the memory efficiency, we have developed all the solutions. Uh, and the other perspective we look at is that uh, we get very similar prediction performance at the Gaussian process. And most of the machine learning researchers are interested in Gaussian process because of many of the interesting properties. Uh, we were interested by the question, okay, what is the relationship between the tensor formulation versus the Gaussian process? And why has the regression uh, uh, formulation uh, achieved good performance? So in order to answer this problem, I just submitted uh, this paper to NIPS, where we have discovered that actually the tensor formulation that we drafted uh, earlier is actually a special form uh, of the Gaussian process. And then you'll be asking the question, if that is the case, why don't you actually go ahead with the Gaussian process? Uh, that is a very good question. The reason we don't do this is because in the Gaussian process, we need to ask the covariance matrix and also need to define the kernel function. And all of us know that the right choice of the kernel function uh, will determine the final prediction results. And our method, the tensor formulation, is basically introducing uh, a, uh, a special form of the kernel so that we will be able to effectively make predictions. So in this particular paper, where we set up the connection to say the tensor formulation is a special form of the Gaussian process with the multilinear kernels. And we also uh, give some of the prediction performance guarantees uh, through this analysis for our tensor formulation. So uh, hopefully this slide gives you a big picture of what we have done uh, in this particular area. Uh, later, the low rank tensor regression problem uh, attract a lot of air, uh, uh, interest of the machine learning researchers. Now it itself has developed into uh, interesting research questions uh, and many theoretical analysis and also more empirical and speeding things up uh, have, been uh, have been developed uh, more and more recently. So uh, with that, I will say that I want to uh, complete the discussion around uh, the tensor formulation for uh, spatial temporal data analysis. Uh, I have a few slides to talk about the details, but given the interest of time, uh, I would like to first stop here to see if you have any questions. Go ahead. So how does the uh, program uh, fit into the Gaussian process? Oh, how do we? Uh, yeah, how do you come? Yeah, so as we discussed in the paper, where uh, basically for the Gaussian uh, process, we have to define kernels. And then we define this multilinear kernel where it imposes the low rank so that we, uh, this will capture uh, the, the low rank constraints for the rest of the tensor formulation. That doesn't include the scalability. Uh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. But that doesn't include the scalability. That doesn't improve the scalability. That's, that's why we look at the tensor formulation. The reason why we want, uh, as a method, to go to the Gaussian process formulation is not trying to say we develop uh, a, a, a fast Gaussian process form. We just try to set up the connections to explain why our simple formulation works. So, th uh, so this is trying to explain that perspective. Any other questions? Would you also estimate a low rank? Answer for the uh, covariance matrix. So, would that be another way of phrasing it? Yeah, we can because it's all incorporated in the covariance matrix. Once you define kernel matrix, everything. Okay. But that said, uh, yeah. is that more expensive than doing the lowering estimation uh, directly? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, that is. Uh, so it's just a way, so uh, I think that we started from different perspective because from Gaussian process, you can say we introduce this kernel and then we develop scalable formulation to make the Gaussian process work. So we sit on the other side, we say that we have this simple formulation. We want to explain why it works and it seems to correspond to a special form of Gaussian process. It doesn't, whether it's uh, scalable or not, it's a different issue, right? Uh, so, uh, but your suggestion is very good, and also people have actually developed something along the line. Uh, there are a few papers published in NIMS and SNL in the past two years. They do discuss this particular population. Okay. So, uh, if uh, there's any no question, how, do I have more time, or do you want to do it? Shut up. <laughs> I think it's a good time to stop because we okay. are perfectly on schedule. Okay. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much.